Could we have uncovered how exactly our universe was created? Does our space history go back further than 13.8 billion years? Well, the $10 billion James Webb telescope is the most complex one ever built and has sent back a snapshot of the early universe, a discovery which President Biden has called a historic moment for science and technology. Who better to tell us whether that is the case than the one and only Professor Brian Cox. Brian, welcome to the program. Thanks so much uh, for joining me. Uh, can we start, first of all, with the telescope? Why is it the most complex telescope ever built? What, what makes it so special? Well, it's by far the, the, the largest and most sensitive telescope we've ever launched into space. I mean, we've all grown up now for 20 years with the Hubble Space Telescope images. So virtually every image you see of beautiful images of galaxies, spectacular clusters of galaxies, all of those things that have become part of our culture are from Hubble. But that's a, an instrument that was designed you know, 30 years ago. So this is a much bigger, much more powerful telescope. And one of the really important things is, which is kind of a technical detail that really matters, is it can see longer wavelengths of light, so-called infrared light. And you may say, well, why does that matter? Well, if we look to very distant galaxies, so we're looking way, way out into the universe, uh, we, we're capturing light that's traveled in some cases for over 13 billion years. So that means we're seeing images with this telescope of the universe as it was very close to the Big Bang. And that light is very stretched because the universe has been expanding and stretching the light. And so for the first time with the web, we expect to be able, and we will be able to see the formation of the first stars, the formation of the first galaxies. So we're going to see the building blocks of the universe begin to coalesce into these structures that ultimately lead to us 13.8 billion years later. There's um there's an image in the, in, in the Times today and it looks spectacular, but I know it's not just about pretty images, but why would it look even more spectacular than, than the Hubble, for example? Is it just because it's a much stronger telescope or is that just me being sort of romantic yeah. about it? Oh, it's like, no, it's like if you, if you go into your back garden with a pair of binoculars and look at the sky, you see nice things. But if you go out with a professional, you know, massive telescope, then you see a lot more nicer things in a lot sharper detail. And that's what this is. It's almost like the Hubble Space Telescope, the old one was binoculars. And this is a, you know, it's, it's an order of magnitude better. And that image you see, you know, it'll be all over the, the papers, as you said this morning in the Times. That image is an image of a piece of sky that you would cover with a grain of sand held at arm's length, right? So imagine wow. a single grain of sand held right at the end within your fingertips. You imagine that dot on the sky. In there, there are thousands of galaxies in that image. And the most remarkable thing about it, amongst the many remarkable things, so thousands of galaxies, is that you'll see sort of distortions in the image, strange distorted shapes of galaxies. And those are galaxies which are far, far, far out into space. The, um, the big, the loads of galaxies, the, the mid-range galaxies are about only the light has only taken about four and a half billion years to reach us from the big galaxies in that image so that began its life when the earth was forming it began its journey when the earth was forming right but the weird distorted ones um, are what's called gravitationally lensed images and so that's light from galaxies that travel for over 13 billion years across the universe and it's been it, you, it's been distorted by the distortion of the fabric of the universe itself the curvature of space-time as predicted by Einstein all those years ago. So you see a huge amount of detail about the way our universe works in that image. And what does it tell us that we didn't know already? What, what does this ability to look so far back into our prehistory, if you will, speaking as a human being, um, what, what, what does it tell us? What, what, what can it reveal and has it revealed anything yet? Well, I mean, these are the first images, so they've not been analysed in, in detail. But, but what, we, what we want to know is we, we only have really theoretical models, which are, you know, not, not quite guesses, but you know what I mean? Then they're theoretical models about how the first stars and galaxies formed. So it's very fundamental questions about how our universe went from something that was basically featureless uh, after the Big Bang to something in which the stars illuminated the darkness for the first time is a, is a big open question. We don't have the data, but now with the web, we will. 
And the other thing to say, by the way, it's got it's got lots of uh, tricks of its sleeve. The web that I think the most interesting, from my perspective, and there's another image going to be released uh, today, actually. So as we speak, they're not out yet. But one of them is of an, uh, what's called an exoplanet, or specifically, it's data and analysis of an exoplanet. So that's a planet around a distant star. It's called WASP 96b. This planet. It's over. <laughs> that's poetic. Light- Great, isn't it? WASP 96b. It's over a thousand light years away from us right orbiting around a distant star and what's going to be released is what's called the spectrum of light from that planet so it's an analysis of the composition of its atmosphere i mean imagine that it's astonishing so a planet over a thousand light years away and we're going to know what's in its atmosphere and uh, that's really interesting because we're, we're looking for water in the atmosphere to these planets but also, you know, right at the far end of the spectrum, if we were to stay on the wish list of astronomers, it'd be oxygen. It, not, not in this planet. We think this is a bit of a Jupiter-like thing. But in the future, it's going to look... Imagine we see oxygen in the atmosphere of a planet around a distant star. That's telling you that there's most likely photosynthesis on that planet. So this telescope could answer the question, are we alone in the universe? which uh, is probably one of the reasons that you sound quite excited about it, because I know that's been a a question on your mind uh, for quite some time. Pam Melroy, uh, NASA's uh, deputy administrator, uh, said that the images moved her as a scientist, as an engineer, and as a human being. Um, Is there a sense of wonder from even the scientific community, not known for their sort of uh, overexcitement about anything normally. Is that yeah, gross mis- it, injustice? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, these, these are genuinely beautiful images, first of all. So putting the science aside. And also I think it's what, what it represents. Um, it represents the, this pure attempt to understand the universe. But for no reason, right, uh, uh, other than we're curious about it. We want to know about these worlds around distant stars. We want to know about these distant galaxies. And, and I think it's it's tremendously important. I mean, the, the great Carl Sagan, one of my heroes, said that um, astronomy is a humbling and character building experience. And the humbling is is in this image. Right? I mean, as I said, thousands of galaxies in a speck of a speck of sky you would cover with a grain of sand <laughs> you know it's tiny so we're in a vast universe but character building because um this quest to understand whether there are others out there whether there's life out there beyond earth it's it's ultimately telling us genuinely although it sounds like a cliche it really isn't it's telling us about what it means to be human because it's telling us the, these these surveys these journeys of exploration uh, we, we're trying to find out if there are if there are any other places nearby where collections of atoms have got together to think and feel and bring meaning to the universe and, and understand its beauty. As you say that that from the NASA administrator, it's a beautiful sentence, isn't it? But when you say something is beautiful and moves you to tears, um, what you're saying is that that there are there are objects in the universe, in this case human beings, that can feel such things. And we really don't know how common that is. I've said many times, I suspect it's extremely rare. So there might be, you know, th- this is a machine that's um, allowing collections of atoms to feel something about their universe and their cosmos. And that's a very special thing. And it feels, I mean, I think the reason I was so struck by it today and by the image is it just feels like a glimmer of light, pardon the pun, uh, you know, when you look around at all of the problems that are besetting us at the moment and, you know, the sort of campaign for the next Tory prime minister and the cost of living crisis and everything else. There is a a sort of sense of relief to to look to the stars and feel, be reminded of the fact that although these things feel huge and looming and present and are, you know, depressing a lot of people, that actually there is a a vastness out there that, that, that it's helpful to be cognizant of. Well, it is, and it's also, I think, really um, useful uh, politically in, in terms of global politics to remember what the stakes are. I think these images tell us about the stakes. At, at one level, you're right, we're tiny, and that there's a certain sense of a, there's a feeling associated with it, understanding how small we are and we're not the centre of the universe. But as I said before, this idea that, that we might be extremely valuable 
and and the, in this corner of the galaxy at least we might be the only things that know these things that can appreciate the beauty i think that does speak to politics actually because it tells us it it it, it, it forces us to take a rather more integrated view of our future put it that way um so i mean you you see it there's a very well known effect called the overview effect with astronauts but it's true i mean virtually every astronaut i've heard speak of seeing the earth even at a very close distance the furthest we've been is out to the moon they, they, they say that they come back with a renewed sense of um optimism and determination to make sure that this civilization persists and survives into the into the far future and i think that's a very real effect so there's nothing wrong it, it often sounds a bit cheesy doesn't it, it uh, people i see it on twitter this morning people say well shouldn't we be concentrating on the problems down here on earth but of course, this quest to understand nature that we call science is it lies at the foundation of our civilization. And it's one of the primary means that we have of solving the problems here on Earth. It's interesting you say that about astronauts. I talked to Tim Peake just a few weeks ago and he said exactly that thing. The sort of rather than feeling diminished, he felt a huge sense of optimism for for all of us on our fragile blue planet. Um, but of course, NASA aren't the only ones exploring the further secrets of the galaxy. You're also going to be doing it on your next, it is your next arena tour, because you've done arenas before, haven't you? It's called Horizons. And um, what can audiences expect? And have you been having to do some last minute re-scripting as a result of the web images? Well, yeah, the, the wonderful thing is, as you say, Horizons is an exploration. It's, it's, how, it's a show about how we came to be here and what we can become it's a show about black holes and the nature of space and time and all this stuff. Sort of, every bizarre and deep question you've ever asked, I hope to try and answer, or at least say we don't know in this show. But the great thing is, as you said, it's arenas. So we have a screen, which is the biggest I've ever taken out on tour. It's, it's nearly 40 meters wide, this LED screen. And what's changed is that now we have the web telescope images. And so I'm going to put them on that screen, obviously, and discuss them. Of course. So it's, it's <laughs> Opportunity to not to be missed. Yeah. So it's going to be it's going to be a wonderful thing. I've spoke to astronomers in the past from Hubble, from the last space telescope, who said, you know, we've only we've only seen these images on a computer screen. And to put them 40 meters wide across the O2 or Birmingham or Manchester or one of these big arenas, it's just something that you don't get the opportunity to do ever. You know, it's, it's so yeah. Uh, so it's going to be even more spectacular now because uh, because I can talk about these new images. Is that the same big screen that you had on on the last tour? I came to see Way it in, in Bournemouth. Bigger. Way bigger. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, we've had to remove the stage. So we have no stage now almost. So we, we've had to build our own stage because the screens won't fit into the O2. <laughs> so it's, it's yeah, I went a bit silly, but, you know. If you you can, mentioned, if you can, yeah, not? when you can, you do. Yeah. Um, you mentioned um, the O2 um, uh, arena, but the one I'm really fascinated by is I think you're going to be bringing the show to the Royal Opera House, which must be just a kind of spectacular thing to be doing. You know, it came up. So, yes, it's, a, it's the first week in August. It's in a couple of weeks time. And it just came up, the opportunity. Um, the, the Opera House needed some uh, a show in there in the, in the summer season. And, they, and I said, you know, I'd love to. So we're going to cram as much of the screen in as we can. I don't want to break <laughs> it. I don't want to damage the Royal Opera House. So as much as we can fit in. And I think it'll be more intimate experience. I'm also being joined by Professor Alice Roberts, actually, so who's a great friend of mine and knows a great deal about evolution, for example, and the history of life on Earth and the evolution of the human, uh, of us, you know, humans. So, um, so we, we're going to, it'll have a different slant and then perhaps a more intimate feel. But that would be the first place, you're right, that I managed to get these beautiful images, most of which are going to be released this afternoon, so I can't wait, and put them on the big LEDs. Well, I'm really excited. I'm hoping they're going to be released during our programme because, of course, I'm speaking to you at 11 a.m. and um, I'm on from one till four. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you, Brian. Thank you so much for taking the time out. Um, physicist uh, Professor Brian Cox. Thanks again for joining me on Times Radio. Tickets for Brian's arena tour at venues across the UK are still on sale and you can get them via his website, briancoxlive.co.uk. Thank you.